Everyone, thanks for joining us. Another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. Today, we are going to talk about the virtues of fortitude and discipline in the life of a professional baseball player. And we'll also go into his faith life and how he shoots to knock it out of the park in both. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. Uh, me, my co-host, John Heinen, and I'm Sam Guzman, and we are happy today to be joined by Michael Krause, a baseball player, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but first, uh, if you enjoy the podcast, please consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, tell your friends. Um, and if you really enjoy the show, please consider uh, supporting us on Patreon. Your support really helps us go a long way towards producing uh, content like this. So patreon.com slash Catholic gentlemen. Uh, there's a lot of different tiers there with some great rewards. So check it out. So today we're joined by, like I said, Michael Krause, who's a professional baseball player. Uh, we, he was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and he kind of had an interesting baseball journey, uh, cut from his high school team twice. Uh, not You don't usually hear that with a professional baseball player, but we kind of started off slow, um, but in college, you really uh, started to see some success and uh, started uh, getting some uh, some awards and accolades. And um, eventually, after graduation, uh, signed on with some professional baseball teams, and now he's with the Cleburne Railroaders in Texas. Uh, so welcome, Michael. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on here. I've been actually following you guys on Instagram for a very long time. Um, so I, this is cool to be on here for sure. Awesome. Yeah, so um, tell us about your baseball journey a little bit. I mean, kind of a, kind of a, a up and down roller coaster there. Uh, but when did you really discover like you love baseball and, and this is something you wanted to do professionally? Uh, when, and when was that big breakthrough for you? Yeah, I mean, geez, how much time do you have? Uh, you know, I have, <laughs> I have a very interesting uh, journey and one that I really wouldn't trade uh, for anything. Uh, when I was a little boy, two years old, my grandfather, who has since passed, uh, and, and grandmother bought me, uh, you know, a t-ball little set or whatever. And and ever since that, I've been absolutely in love with the game. Um, you know, they say Moneyball, like, how can you not be romantic about baseball? And, and it's it's our pastime as Americans. And ever since I was a little boy, I wanted to play professionally. I mean, who doesn't? Um, you know, and, and I think I believed that I could for a really long time. I was always the kid, uh, you know, up until age 12, I was the best player on the team. Um, you know, some of my friends might argue with that, I'm not if they're ever going to listen to this, but, uh, but, but, you know, some, some things ended up happening where I just didn't grow as fast as the rest of the kids. Um, and baseball is like one of those sports where, you know, at age 12, boys start getting their man bodies. And that didn't happen for me until I was like 16. So everyone passed me up. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I ended up getting, yeah, like you said, cut twice from my high school team and uh, ultimately never really played a meaningful varsity inning of baseball. Uh, and that wasn't for a lack of trying. My teammates were, you know, simply better than me. Um, in high school, they were bigger than me. They were stronger than me. They threw harder than me. They hit the ball further than me. Um, and it, it was just like a boy amongst men. And so I just never really got the opportunity to play. And uh, I said, well, I guess that's not God's plan for me. Um, and uh, I went to Xavier University just as a regular student. And uh, I actually, you know, and I said this to you guys in the, uh, I guess, bio I sent you. One of the things that's particularly interesting to me about baseball in my life is I try to like step back like 40,000 feet and, and look at how, um, you know, God has influenced it. Uh, every single time uh, baseball has ended in my life, some and it's every time it's been a man has walked into my life and refocused me and it's always been someone different um but uh it, it's it's almost too much to be a coincidence so those first two times I was cut I had a um a friend's dad who was a, a weight trainer and was very close friends with uh you know my high school coach and he took me under his wing and um he trained me and uh 
and also told the coach, Hey, you need to put this kid on JV. And so, uh, that was super helpful. And then after I got, after I'd left high school ball and just went to college, um, I had a guy, uh, coach Bondi was his name, um, who called me and he's like, Hey, I need you to play summer ball, American Legion summer ball with me. And I was like, well, what's the point? You know, I, I didn't even play high school ball. And he's like, I believe in you. And, uh, and I owe so much to him. And I ended up having one of the best, you know, baseball summers of my life. And it really reinvigorated this, you know, desire for me to, to continue to play baseball. So, um, you know, my freshman year of college, I was six foot one, 138 pounds. And I realized that was not going to cut it if I wanted to play college ball. So, uh, I discovered a couple of resources online and realized I just needed to eat and lift, uh, everything I saw. So I gained 40 pounds in three months. Uh, I was eating seven to 10 meals a day. Um, and yeah, wow. just eating was not, yeah, it wasn't fun. I was just sick to my stomach and lifting everything I could. And, uh, and uh, ended up at St. Bonaventure University. I transferred, um, and uh, I was one of the worst Division One baseball pitchers in the country, if not the worst. Um, you know, oddly enough, I uh, I think you know I was walking three batters for every one batter I was striking out, which is really bad. Um, and uh, and for that reason, didn't get to pitch a whole lot. Um, and then finally, in 2020. Uh, I ended up, you know, uh, pitching. Okay. I was still walking some guys, but a zero ERA and then, uh, COVID hits, they cancel our season. And, uh, I remember being like, really God, like, this is, this is what you're throwing at me. Now you finally let me this thing that I poured everything into and I finally start pitching well and you're, and it's being taken away from me. But, uh, what a gift it was what happened because I ended up transferring to a division two powerhouse called Mercier's university, just two hours North of my home in Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Joe Spano there, my head coach, he, um, he changed my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I got there day one. It was funny. I, I and I could talk more about this later, but I had been saying a, a novena to St. Jude for the last year, just about. So uh, and the novena was just please let me play professional baseball in some capacity, like just like even if it's for a week. Like I want to be able to say I did this because I've poured my life into it for the last five years. And um, I get to Mercyhurst week one and I'm like, here I am going from division one to division two. And I figured I'd be the guy like on campus. And I show up there day one and everyone's throwing harder than me. I mean, these guys were good. They were all throwing, you know, 92, 94. And at the time I was 87, 89, touching 90, 91. And, um, and I remember calling my dad and saying, what was the point of any of this? Like, this is like, I'm not going to pitch here. And um Joe Spano took me under his wing. We used some data and realized that, you know, I was throwing a slider that was uh, by the metrics, a major league baseball slider. Um, one of the best in major leagues. And he's like, well, let's just start throwing that more. And, uh, and that changed my life. And then I ended up being at Mercyhurst, uh, um, first team all conference, first team all region, uh, second team all American. Um, I l- actually led the country in strikeout to walk ratio, wow. um, versus when I was at, uh, Bonaventure, I did the exact opposite. I probably led the country and walk to strike power. <laughs> <which is> horrible. <laughs> um, but, uh, I ended up signing a contract with, um, a team in this league, actually the Houston Apollos. And, uh, I remember I was on the plane and it like hit me. I was like, Oh my gosh, this novena, the St. Jude. I was so, cause I, I when, when I got to Mercer's, I was like, I cut that novena because I said it didn't work. Yeah. These things don't work. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, what, what a waste of time this novena was. Um, and, uh, and I'm on this plane, uh, to Fargo, North Dakota. And I like almost broke down. I was like, Holy cow, I forgot about this. And, and uh, so much of what has happened in my mind is impossible. Um, uh, and that to me means that there's something, you know, on a spiritual level or on a divine level that's working. Um, and I'm not sure what it's for yet, you know, but, um, but that's just kind of a brief, I ended up not, well, now I should say I'm with the Cleveland Railroaders, uh, in the, in the American association. Um, and, uh, last year I was with them as well. I, I, for other reasons, I ended up joining them, but, uh, but last year I was the reliever of the year on this team by the grace of God. And, uh, and this year I'm having a pretty good year too. So hopefully that continues. So please keep me in your prayers, especially for health, uh, uh, cause that's really the biggest concern for us pitchers is, you know, how many bullets do you have left in that arm? But I don't know. Yeah. I, I kind of briefly went over over things. I hope that's a you know a decent overview of kind of my journey to where I am right here, sitting in this chair. But um, yeah, feel free to ask anything else. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really grateful to hear all that stuff. I uh, likewise greatly enjoy baseball. I believe it was a priest and uh, 
Um, it took me and a couple of the guys to a, my first baseball game ever with uh, Texas Rangers and uh, Boston Red Sox. Uh, we were sitting front row because some parishioner was wealthy and gave a ton of tickets. Yeah. And so that was a, it was a pivotal time in my life. And so you said a lot and we could dive into a lot. I actually want to take a step back and I want to go back to um, when did you decide that you wanted to be a professional baseball player and what gave you the resiliency or the drive to keep on when you were, you know, striking out and getting kicked out and in and, um, and, and high school and even in college, it seems like you, you're definitely beating the odds. And at the same time, you know, maybe a little uh, foolish with uh, the, the drive that was moving you forward, but, but you were able to, you're able to succeed. And, uh, and so I'd love to hear uh, why, why baseball in the sense of like, why did you want to be, become that pro- a professional baseball player? Like when did that spark hit? Because I know you have multiple degrees and we'll talk about that you know, but then it just, you just kept on moving and you kept on per, um, persevering. And, uh, and then, and, and what, what kept you from turning to, um, you know, the bottle, if you will, or turning away <laughs> and, and still, and still pursuing. I mean, I think it's pretty incredible uh, with, with the down and outs that you've had to, uh, to, to stick with it. And, and I'd love to hear you spend a little bit more time talking about that. Yeah, I mean, um, I think foolish was a good word. Uh, you know, ever since, you know, to answer what I wanted to be a professional baseball player, um, it was ever since I was two years old. It's funny, I went to bring your child to work day with my mom. And uh, I remember back to back years, one year it said I wanted to be a priest. And one year it said I wanted to be a professional baseball player, but I always go back and forth. Excellent. <laughs> um, so obviously I was raised in a, but well, I mean, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, my upbringing, I think, was one that um, that led me to believe uh, and maybe it's foolish, but like you can create just about anything in this life that you want, good or, good or, good or bad, especially in this country. Um, you know, my, I, I was raised in a military family. Um, my dad uh, was he's, he's an older guy. He was actually a Vietnam era uh, Navy naval aviator. Um, and so I got a lot of that instilled in me, um, you know, the military mindset of, you know, don't you don't complain you if you don't complain about something just fix it you know and so uh that's kind of where I was at uh in terms of okay well I can do if my dad can land planes on uh aircraft carriers in the middle of the ocean then I should be able to figure this out somehow to throw a baseball a little harder and get someone to sign me um but it didn't come without it's like downs um you know, especially in high school, you know, getting cut twice was probably the hardest um, thing that's ever happened to me, which is, that sounds so like, that's just how blessed I am, that that's one of the hardest things that's ever happened to me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I just believed, I just constantly believed, and I don't know why that was. And, and from the beginning, it wasn't really a, a faith thing for me until much more recently. Um, it wasn't until I got to St. Bonaventure and I met, um, which is a Franciscan Catholic university. Mm -hmm. Um, And I met uh, a priest there, Father Ross Chamberlain. And he he really, I think he saw through a lot of my faith was superficial and self-serving. And, um, and he took his time, but started to dig into that. And, um, and I realized, you know, I'm not using this as my rock. And, uh, and it's, it's funny. uh, One of the biggest things that changed for me was he started hammering me on um, Mary, you know, the blessed, the blessed mother. And I was angry with him. I was angry with him to the point where I was like, I don't need Mary. Like, I, I don't need to have a relationship with her in any capacity. I've got Jesus. Um, and I thought it was kind of strange that he would want me and it almost emasculated me to have to talk to, you know, you know, the, the blessed mother. And, you know, I go back and we'll, we'll have a drink together sometimes and, and he'll say, and I'll tell him, I'll say, I really think that was the devil inside of me, keeping me from that relationship. Um, and as soon as I opened that relationship up, um, I started praying the rosary every day, everything in my life changed, everything mm-hmm. changed. Um, and so I, I, I owe so much to her and I always promise her and St. Jude, I said, like, if, if, if anyone asks me to give credit, I'm going to give it to you too. Um, mm-hmm. because they both have, I believe interceded for me in so many ways, um, and have changed my life. So 
Uh, I think at the beginning, in terms of you guys are talking about fortitude, I think in the beginning, I used mostly like this, uh, you know, military, you know, American mindset um, to get, you know, to St. Bonaventure, you know, to get to Division One baseball, but to get to professional baseball, it's been uh, so much more for me about faith. I still use a lot of that stuff and I believe in it, like the, the yeah. American mindset, the military mindset, but I don't think the two can, the two can actually, I think have a pretty good marriage together. Um, in my opinion, I think they, they, they go hand in hand and help me, um, to this day. Uh, Amen. so my faith and that mindset. Amen. That's awesome. Yeah. Amen to all of that. Uh, I think when you start, uh, uh, getting to know the Blessed Virgin Mary, things happen. So that's cool. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, now you've, you've kind of arrived in the sense that you're, you're, you're living the dream. You're, you're, you're playing, you're playing uh, professional baseball. It's awesome. Um, but what's that life like for you? I mean, uh, you mentioned some of like having to take care of yourself because, you know, pitching is a really demanding um, uh, position and, um, you know, your arm can only ha- handle so much, but, but what do you, what are some of the things you love about being, uh, that the life of a professional baseball player? And what are some of the things that are a little harder? You know, like, I don't want to use the word hate, but like, what are some of the things that are a little more of a struggle for you as you're living that life? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people would think like, what's not to love. And I think, you know, I'm not ever going to complain about, you know, my lifestyle now because it's, it's an absolute blessing. Um, and I'm grateful to God for it. I mean, there's some challenges for sure in terms of like, what is the best thing? You know, I think the best thing is seeing little kids come up and look at you like you're a superstar. It still doesn't never gets old to me when they ask for my autograph. Um, I, cause I, I see myself in those kids and, um, and it's just crazy to think that people, you know, especially today, you know, people's harder money, it doesn't go as far um, with everything going on in the country with inflation and everything. And, and for them to come pay to watch me throw a baseball and play a little boy, little boys game. Um, that is crazy in my mind. In fact, I was just talking uh, to my, my girlfriend last night and she was listening to the feed, uh, the, the broadcast. And she's like, I heard people yelling mean, like obscene things at you. And, uh, and she's like, it made me so mad. And I said, I said, it's, it's just part of it. You know, like it's, it's, it's in, in and of itself is a blessing too, to have that opportunity to have people come yell mean things at you at a baseball field. Like I wouldn't trade that for anything, you know? Um, so just all of that is, is, you know, probably my favorite part of the game in terms of like, what's difficult, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a lot more stressful than I thought it would be as I, I, I'm a reliever. So I'm in the bullpen. I don't know what days I'm throwing. Um, so my cortisol levels are through the roof pretty much every single day. <laughs> um, and so I usually throw like one of the last innings. I'm not quite the closer, but I'll, I'll usually be around the seventh or eighth inning. And, um, and like the fourth inning rolls around and my stomach starts hurting. I start thinking like doubting myself sometimes. Um, but you know, that's when faith comes in for me. I usually get down. And if I feel that anxiety, I think about, um, there's a Psalms passage too that says, you know, cast your anxiety onto me. And so I always do that. I say, I'm giving it to you. Like, please take it from me. Um, and, uh, and then I'll sit down and I'll, I'll, I'll usually have a conversation with, uh, with Mary, just asking her to help me, like, please just, just calm me down. And if it's, if it's possible to keep me healthy above anything else, you know, I'll appreciate that. So I think the stress is probably something, the stress and the travel, the travel is really brutal in this league too. Uh, we're down in, I know you said you're, uh, John, you're down in DFW. Um, and if you look at the map of our division, most of the teams are in Chicago, but like right now we're in Fargo, North Dakota. So we Mm. have a, you know, about a 20 hour bus ride with stops. Um, but we'll go all the way up to Canada too. We play in Winnipeg, Canada. It's 24 hours. No, like with stops. Um, so the travels is tough, um, physically and mentally. Um, but I still think the stress, I wasn't expecting the stress and, uh, and, uh, the stress is definitely for me, the the hardest part of, of, of my job, if you want to call it that. So yeah, what an opportunity to practice that uh, confident abandonment to to God, you know, through Our Lady. I think that uh, that you're definitely being given that, and 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 how great is that? Um, I do want to talk just because you brought it up. Is is what does the Catholic faith look like in professional baseball? I know that I as professional musician for for many many years, and uh, uh, and there was no faith life, and in fact. Um, 
uh, you were challenged a lot in the music world to uh, not speak your mind, to be, you know, uh, more cautious. And so I imagine in professional sports, it's it's that or worse. And so I but I'd love to hear from you what what your experience is as, as living, being a vocal devout Catholic. I mean, you're here on a on a you know international podcast uh, comfortably talking about your faith, how it's affected your life and how you're still actively a professional baseball player. So I'd love to hear from you about that sort of tension and uh, uh, that you experience. Yeah. Um, you know, the first thing I, that came to mind when you said, what does, you know, Catholicism look like in professional baseball? I wanted to say it looks pretty Protestant, first of <laughs> yeah. all. So okay. those of us that are Christian uh, down here uh, and throughout baseball tend to be very Protestant. So um, one of the first things I, I talked with Father Ross, my my uh, spiritual guide um, from St. Bonaventure, I, I didn't know until I got down to Texas that the sign of the cross was Catholic. I was just raised you know, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where everyone is either Polish, Italian, or Irish. Awesome. Um, and and everyone makes a sign of the cross. So as soon as I got down there, I find that out. Um, I said, all right, well, after every inning, good or bad, I'm going to make the sign of the cross. And uh, and people, it might make people uncomfortable here, but that's, I'm proud to be Catholic, you know? And uh, and so that was the first thing I wanted to say is that those of us that are Christian are just Protestant for the most part in baseball. Um Because we have so many Southern boys that play baseball. Mm. It's like a Southern sport. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of like the ugly uh, you know, what I can't speak to like what happens in the major leagues, although I've, I've talked to a lot of guys, uh, that have played there. And I, and I think, you know, I, I struggle to say whether it's as bad as our imaginations can run or not. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a spectrum. And so I think a lot of the times it's dictated by, uh, what the leadership in a certain clubhouse or locker room looks like. Um, you know, I, I mentioned briefly that I started out last year on a team, uh, a team called the Houston Apollos. Uh, and I got there and I stayed for about a week and a half. And I realized, I said, if this is professional baseball, I don't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it had a lot of the stuff going on that, um, you know, that I, I just, I thought spiritually for me, wasn't, um, wasn't good. And, uh, and I was fully prepared to hang up the cleats and walk away from baseball over it. Um, but God had different plans, but the stuff that was going on, you know, you can use your imagination, you know, it is true. Like the, you can get yourself into trouble very quickly, uh, yeah. in this lifestyle. And, uh, you know, one of the things I said to my parents, when I, I actually flew home from this Houston uh, this first professional team I was with, and I just, I explained everything to them. I just said, this isn't for me. And um, I thought it was a really dangerous place for me spiritually after all the hard work that I had gone through. And, and uh, I was actually fully prepared at that point um, was going through the process of signing up for uh, the Marine Corps. And, uh, and I was really excited for that. And I had this weird juxtaposition because my officer selection officer at the time was a devout Catholic and he had a rosary that he prayed every day. Uh -huh. um, he was an infantry guy. And I was like, uh -huh. really I was like, wow, like that is what I want. Like someone who's willing to, you know, lay his life down for, for someone else and, and, uh, and still, uh, you know, be proud of his Catholic faith. So I was really going in that direction. And, uh, and then I get a phone call and the, like literally in the airport from Cleburne and they said like, we need you. And we, cause I had just pitched against them. And I remember thinking, you know, is this going to be just the same yeah. as the last team? Do I really want to be involved with that? And so my mom and my dad were like, honestly, I think they were more excited about that opportunity than I was. Um, but they're like, listen, just go for a week. And if it's bad, then come home and yeah. uh, we'll be done with this. And I got there and I, there's a, I don't know that he'll listen to this. He's a, he's a good product. He, we go back and forth uh, about Catholicism versus good. being a Protestant, but um, a captain on my team, as soon as I walked in the door in that clubhouse, I could tell that he was different. Like um, he's our center fielder. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, might very well be a saint if that's even mm. possible for Protestants. But um, I knew right then that I was in a clubhouse that God wanted me to be in. Um, and people did not act in a way that was inappropriate for the most part. Um, I mean, it was just a the group of guys in this clubhouse wow. are just like, there's so many devout Christians, so many married men that are committed to their, um, committed to their wives or, or fiancés and girlfriends. Um, and, uh, and it's just a tremendous blessing. So that aspect here, you know, I, I can't speak, I think it's just different in every clubhouse. You know, there's some clubhouses that are founded in a way that, uh, 
you know, have a foundation of trouble. And, and then ours is one that's, you know, has a foundation of, of Jesus Christ. I can really say that for the most part. So, um, but one thing I do want to say is uh, when I'm at home, like at home series in Cleburne, I actually go to mass every Sunday. Um, I would never miss it, but on the road, we, it's, it's much harder to, if not impossible, because we play on Sundays in the mornings. Uh, but what they do for professional baseball at every single level, at every single game on Sundays, there's an organization called the Baseball Chapel that you can actually um, donate to as well. It's mostly funded by Major League Baseball players, but every Sunday there's a chaplain in the dugout, and uh, and we do about 30 minutes of scripture review um, and prayer. Uh, and so it's uh, that that is kind of what it's it's just very helpful when you can't get to mass. Um, mm. Because that to have that time period to to spend with uh, with you know men of of like mindedness in terms of their following of Jesus Christ, so um, that's kind of what it looks like. I don't know if I if I uh, went. Yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, no, no, that, no I but. appreciate that. Well, it sounds like you know God. I mean, you mentioned men, you know, uh, outside of the faith still being. Um, you know, man of Christ and, and virtuous and virtue does certainly doesn't know any bounds. And so, you know, thanks be to God for, for that opportunity. And, and yeah, you can really, really clearly see God still calling you and still hunting after you and, uh, and bringing you to something like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, it's, it's awesome that, you know, as a person of faith, uh, you have opportunity to witness to that in, in the sports world. Uh, you know, just little gestures like making the sign of the cross. I mean, as a spectator, I notice stuff like that, you know, I was like, oh, I think I must be Catholic, you know, and it, yeah. it's, it's cool. And I, I think if nothing else, it raises questions and you have an opportunity to kind of change the culture through your own witness. And, and that's a, that's an awesome thing. So um, one question though is like, you know, you, you've accomplished a lot of your goals kind of against all odds. And that's, that's awesome. Like just to see your perseverance and how you've, you've kind of got where you wanted to go, but, but I guess, you know, as you're, as you're thinking about the future, like, what do you feel like is next for you? I mean, are you, are you looking to go like major league or like, are you looking to, you know, just keep, keep playing for, for your, for your team now and then find something else after that, like maybe the military or like what kind of what was a, what are some of your goals in life and, and what are you looking to, to uh, go next? Yeah, um, I think most of my life I've lived, uh, like in the past, I've lived for the future. And mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a difficult way to, I think most people probably live life like that. Um, but I've, I've tried really hard to, um, to be where my feet are right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, we exist. Our job is one that um, we're constantly, it's hard not to think about what tomorrow brings in a lot of ways, but uh, you know, we could be, I could be traded uh, tomorrow to a new city. Um, I could be released. My job is always on the line. Uh, there's zero job security in this sport. There's thousands, you know, if not millions of, of people that want my job. Um, and so there's that it could be released, uh, you know, in terms of, trying to move up the food chain of baseball, of course, I, I would, I would love that, you know, and, and it's a, it's a bigger platform, a bigger opportunity to, to be a witness, uh, to Christian fealty, um, Catholic fealty, I should say on this yeah. podcast. Right. So, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I don't really know. I'm, I, I, I was talking to a teammate yesterday about this, where he's actually giving me a hard time about something. And I don't, I don't really like when guys, you know, try to intimidate me, especially on, uh, if they're supposed to be like a teammate. And I remember I said to him, I was like, listen, man, there's, there's things in this world I'm afraid of, but you are not one of them. And, uh, and he said, I remember he said, yeah, I think we're all getting the impression that you're not afraid of losing your job. And I said, I'm not, I'm really not like if God, if that's, if it's, if it's time for me to be done with this game, I have, God has given me so much more than I could have ever asked for. Like, yeah. or I guess I did ask for it. So I'm not sure how accurate that is, but he blessed me beyond what was reasonable or possible. Yeah. Really. If you look at some kid who's been cut twice, I said this to my dad on the phone the other day, I was like, dad, you know, could you imagine back in what was that? 2011, 2012, when I got cut, from high school, if you went up to my high school coach and said, or any of us and said, you know, this kid's going to play, someone's going to pay him to play baseball in, you know, seven, eight years, everyone would have laughed in your face, you know? And, and so I, it, I can't ask for really anything else. I feel like it's selfish to ask for more. Um, but 
you know, in terms of the future, I, I don't really know what it brings, but I'm going to just kind of stay where my feet are right now and, and try to just be as grateful as possible to a God that is, is beyond generous to me. So Amen. great answer. I love it. Yeah, that was a great answer. Yeah. So honestly, I'm just going to, yeah, we talked about this on episode 52 with uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Majors, uh, that you cannot sanctify the future by worrying about it, you know, exactly. and, um, and you can't sanctify the past by ruminating on it, I believe is, is what he said on that episode. And then, yeah, I mean, it's something I've been reflecting on a lot uh, recently is, you know, in the Hail Mary, we pray, you know, pray for us now end at the hour of our death, not pray for us now and every single day in between. And, you know, it's, it's our, it's, we got to focus on the presence. We got to focus on the here and now. And again, that abandonment to God's will is really coming up. Um, and what you're saying, you know, is just kind of that uniformity with God's will and, and how it takes place in the life of a professional baseball player and in, 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 in your life. So what um, you mentioned praying uh, St. Jude for a year. I've also prayed incessant novenas to St. Joseph for a couple of years and, and things of that nature. Um, really just trying to abandon ourselves to, to God's will and to open it up and to have their intercessions to help guide us. What are you doing on a daily, weekly basis now uh, to help you spiritually stay grounded what are some of your favorite devotions that you stick with yeah so uh every single day i have sort of a, a bedrock of prayers that i go through um as soon as i wake up i say a rosary um every single day so uh and that was something that was like i said i i, I attribute so much of what has happened to the blessed mother i just can't uh and I get a lot of hard times from my Protestant friends about it down here. And I just don't understand, like when you read the Bible, like they always say, first they say we worship her, which isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, but then second, they come back and say, oh, you don't worship her, but why do you pray to her? Like, why do you ask her to pray for you when you could just talk to Jesus? And I'm like, do you not read your Bible? Like, like I just don't understand because because like Jesus says you should ask people to pray for you. So if they're comfortable, like all my Protestant friends who I love dearly are comfortable asking, for instance, me to pray for them. But you don't think that the mother of Jesus Christ has a little bit better of an in with with him than than maybe you do, um, you know. And so you know that 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 to me, a lot of my foundational like bedrock prayers are around her. So right now what I'm going through is, is I'll get up and I'll say the rosary every single day and whatever mysteries are for that day. And then, um, uh, I also am saying a novena to our lady of good success as well, which, um, I attribute a lot of my success to, um, so I say that every single day. Um, I also have a Marian devotion that I say every single day. Uh, so I don't know if you're getting the theme here. Um, but uh, so those three things I do every single day. Um, and then I try to read scripture every single day. And right now I just got into, um, I am a, a disciple of Bishop Barron. Uh, his Word on Fire uh, Bible has helped me treme tremendously. Um, so about... I don't know, I'd say two years ago, I realized uh, Father Ross again um, from St. Bonaventure University was like, I, I always said I wanted to date, this is this is a side note, but I always said I wanted to date a Protestant girl because they read their Bible so well. And, uh, and, and I said, of course, I'll convert her, right? But, but I wanted to date her because they challenged me in the, in, in the Bible. Because when you talk to them, they can often like, they can just, it's impressive that they can just recite scripture, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, he looks at me, and he's like, well, what are you doing in that arena? And I said, honestly, nothing like I'm not I'm not reading my Bible. And so he gifted me uh, maybe the best gift I've ever received in life, uh, the word on fire gospel. And uh, just going through that has has changed my life. So I try to read scripture every day, too. So those four things um, uh, are, are kind of my I don't know, I guess, game plan every single day. I just as long as I have those like I have missed one before, like during a game and I feel everything is out of whack. Yeah. Like I just feel everything is out of whack. So um, that's just kind of what I do, I guess, every single day in terms of my uh, faith. So, yeah, no, that's so important for habit and manly virtue growing is, is, is sticking with our prayer and making that uh, that pinnacle, the cornerstone of our days. And so I'm grateful to hear you say all those things, because there's a lot of our listeners who might be um, falling away from their daily practices or looking for new daily practices or things of that nature. So I find it always um 
helpful and, uh, and, and hopeful to, uh, to hear from, you know, somebody like you and, and what you're doing to stay grounded. So I think that's great. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, it's like spiritual training camp, you know, for you, uh, to like, to do these things every day and, and, uh, and it is a practice. And I guess that's like kind of a, kind of a last question for me is like, uh, you've hinted at this in various ways. Um, but how has sports, like what opportunities have there been to grow in your faith? Like, like how has the discipline of playing baseball and the discipline of training for, for that helped you grow in your faith, if at all? Um, and like, where's the overlap there, I guess. And, and, um, how has it helped you grow in virtue? Yeah. So, uh, that's a, a, a very good question. And one that I reflect upon actually quite often. Um, you know, I think I talk about, and I haven't, I've gone into detail and probably rambled too much cause I'm Italian, but, um, you know, what the first I look at baseball very much so at least my adults or you know teen to adult years in two phases and uh you know the first phase was one that was very self-serving um and you could see that in my prayer life and uh and so what I mean by that is you know I, I did everything I could to use my faith to further baseball and um early on and when I shifted that and I realized how selfish that was, and in fact, one of the reasons why I realized how selfish that was, was during that St. Jude Novena, um, I I got really interested in the story of, oh, what's the name of the guy that founded St. Jude Hospital? Is it Joe Thomas? Is that, is that I can't remember his name. He's got like yeah, a really a- common name, but his story, if your listeners haven't um, really gone back and, and, and read through like, how he ended up founding the hospitals um, is really moving. Um, and, uh, and I realized in that moment that, you know, I feel like God realized I was using him to try to further my baseball career. And it wasn't until I realized how selfish that was um, and tried to flip it around that things kind of changed for me. And so mm-hmm. now it's, it's how does baseball help my faith life? And to be honest with you, you know, the off season is much more challenging for my faith than, uh, the actual season. And, uh, and I've, I've sort of realized that I feel like I exist better in a world where it's all or nothing, where, you know, my job is on the line constantly, um, because it forces me to have a faith that's stronger because of like the, the stress associated with it. If I didn't have a, a foundation of faith, I'm not sure, I'm really not sure that I could handle it mentally. Um, certainly wouldn't perform as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to, uh, to that end, it's just, it's, it's how can I use my, my baseball career to strengthen my faith and to also evangelize in some way. Um, I'm not a big fan of being preachy. And one thing I'll say is, you know, I always, I'll walk into a room and I assume I'm the worst sinner there always. Um, and I grew up in a, in a household that was very strict Catholic household. Um, I had uh, Italian Catholics on one side uh, and they were, they were kind of the fun Catholics. And then I had Irish Catholics on my mom's side that you stood up like this and sat like this. I never spoke in church, even as an infant. Um, and so I didn't so much as cry. Uh, and so, you know, I had this weird sort of, uh, you know, idea well it's not weird i mean i i believe i'm the worst sinner in the room i'm sure i'm the worst sinner in this group chat or whatever that we're doing now and and uh and yet god still blesses me constantly and i i have to imagine it's because i'm just getting up and trying you know like i'm doing my i'm I'm doing my best every day to be better and uh i think being a catholic man um can be daunting especially because uh we live in a time today where uh so many people discount that masculinity in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, all you have to do is, you know, turn on the TV and they're shouting down what it means to be a man, you know, especially a Catholic man. Um, but it's so important for our families, for our communities to have men um, without me. Like when I look at my life, um, I look around and I see, I see, like if I have to ask myself how I've been successful in any capacity in my life, it's because of, you know, men in my life who were, who were 
mm-hmm. good men. And most of the time mm-hmm. they were good Catholic men. And, um, and so, you know, the one I wanted to make sure I, I said two things, um, really three things on this podcast. And that was number one, um, it's okay to be a strong Catholic man. And we need that desperately. It's more than okay. We need it desperately in our families. We need it desperately in our communities and in our parishes. Um, and kids like me, like little kids, when I was a little kid, I needed to see that. Um, and uh, had I not seen those men, I'm not sure where I'd be right now. I probably wouldn't be on this podcast. Um, uh, so that, uh, the other thing that I wanted to say too, was that, you know, I'm, I am not, I, I don't want people to get this idea that I'm a saint or anything like that mm-hmm. from this podcast. I am a, a total and complete failure in a lot of ways in my life and in faith. And, um, you know, when I fall, I fall on Jesus. I try to and have him pick me back up. And, and when I really fall and I can't even, I feel almost too ashamed to talk to Jesus. I talk to Mary and I say, can you talk to your son for me? Can we fix this in some capacity? And that's my third point is, um, you know, I hope that, uh, more so than anything else with this podcast, maybe there's a kid out there watching this that, you know, under that that sees me as a professional athlete um in a way that i guess maybe they're more likely to say hey let me explore my relationship with the blessed virgin mother mary like um i can't reiterate enough i've said it a lot but um that relationship is one that has changed my life when i'm on the mound i'll say this much if you ever get the chance to watch one of my games people might think i'm crazy i sit out there the whole time everyone's looking at you as the pitcher right I speak, it looks like I'm speaking to myself, but I'm not. I'll sit in full-blown conversations in prayer out loud on the mound. Um, you know, with Mary, I feel like I'm sitting there on the mound. I don't feel alone. Um, and I felt alone in the past, but I feel like I, I have Mary I've, and I've got Jesus right there with me. And I'll sit there and I'll talk to him the whole time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll ask for a strikeout. Sometimes I'll ask them to calm my heart down. Uh, sometimes I'll ask them to just not let me get hurt if my arm's feeling a little uh, crummy, but, um, but I just hope that's what people get from this is, is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a broken sinner. Um, but I'm leaning on some giants, you know, some, some, some spiritual giants that are, are there to help you and there to really have a relationship with you. So. Uh, it's awesome. Well stated. I'm, I'm glad that you reflected on these things and you're able to write it to us and into our audience. So, I do have uh, a couple more questions that aren't uh, um, a little more, you know, carefree. I've noticed when you and I have been trying to connect with each other that you have intentionally distanced yourself from technology to a degree, um, you know, not not on your phone nonstop and stuff like that. What does that look like for you? Does that help your life? Are you um, aware of the grips of technology and the addictive aspects of it? Or is it really just, Hey, I can't be a great baseball player. If you know, I'm, I'm glued to these, these devices. I, I just wanted to hear that from you. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I'll keep bringing up father Ross. He's going to, he's actually a, a, a listener to you guys. So I, ah, I haven't wonderful. told him yet that I'm going to be on this. So He'll, he'll hear this. Uh, it'll be a gift to him. Uh, and he's been, again, thank you, Father Ross, for everything. You have been an amazing, amazing spiritual mentor to me. Um, but one of the first things we chatted about um, back at the St. Bonaventure was, I was like, you know what? It would be so much easier to a young man um, to be a saint without our cell phones. Mm-hmm. And uh, so much of my sinfulness uh, comes from this right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, there's the big ones, right? Like if you go on Instagram, um, there's a bunch of pretty girls on there and, and, uh, it's easy to, to go through and and get, you know, stuck in lust, uh, anytime you open Instagram or really anything. And and quite frankly, culture is designed to do that to you right now. Um, and it's sad. I don't even know you guys have kids. I don't know how you, uh, manage, uh, the technology aspect with kids. And hopefully someday I get to be a father and I already worry about it now. Um, so, uh, it's just, it's, it's not conducive in that arena. Um, but even more so it kind of becomes, uh, you know, a God in in a way. So you sit there and it's like, um, you wait for it to buzz, you know, you wait for that, like, like that dopamine rush. Someone's, someone's, uh, you know, wants my attention or thinks I'm worthy enough of their attention when we already know that we're all worthy enough of, of attention from the most important, uh, you know, man slash God, both that has ever yeah. walked this, the face of the earth. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of the things that I struggle with. I think I'm a lot better at it now. I, uh, I, 
I still struggle with it though. I don't want to act like I'm good at it, but yeah, I, at the time that you and I had texted, it was actually during spring training and I had had a really bad outing. Um, I'd given up three runs in spring training and, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I have this really good slider, uh, that I, I rely upon and, uh, it, no one taught me it. It was a pure gift from God. I don't know if you know, also Mariano Rivera has a similar story. He has mm. a cutter, uh, yeah. that nobody taught him. But God gave him and he openly says, you know, I, God gave me this pitch and he throws it over and over and over again and nobody can hit it. Um, and, you know, he used it to evangelize. And in spring training, I lost my slider. It was my only pitch that really, you know, I have a fastball, too, that's, you know, 90-92 and I, that can get higher than that sometimes. But but the slider is what get, get, puts food on my table, you know, and in that outing, I had lost it. And I'm like, what is going on mentally? Like, like what's going on spiritually or anything? So when that stuff like that happens, my initial reaction is to walk away from technology and to move closer to, um, spiritual life in some capacity. And also I get really analytical and try to figure things out mentally as well. But, yeah. but yeah, so I, I do my best, you know, I wish, I know a couple of trainers in baseball that actually, uh, will not permit their, uh, trainees to have a smartphone. A lot of people are switching to flip phones. Awesome. And I think that's a, a really smart, uh, decision to make but uh yeah. but yeah technology is extremely dangerous dangerous for uh especially for us catholic men yeah amen well and i know thomas kempis talked about you know one of the best ways to avoid sin is to not allow its entrance you know and and i see that with with technology so frequently is that you know if we don't we don't even crack open the door for, for Satan's entrance. We're going to be a lot more successful than if the door is open and now we're having to fight it. And so I, um, yeah, I agree with that very much. So that's awesome. So uh, my last question is a short, should be a short question is what type of preferred baseball gloves um, should men go towards? And I ask that because I've been asked that by fathers here on the Catholic gentlemen, it comes up in our, in our group chats, because there's gloves that are, you know, I, I need to get my son a glove. So there's personal self-seeking here, but what would you recommend for, for a uh, first glove? First glove, um, a first glove. Are we talking like for a kid? Yeah. First glove for a kid and then gloves, you know, just the general, um, uh, going to going forward. Yeah. So, you know, first glove for a kid get, I would just take them to Dick's Sporting Goods and let them pick it out themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, I know my mom, <laughs> my mom picked out my, she always picked out my bat, my glove, all that stuff and just brought it home. And I wish, uh, and I'm, and God bless her. I love her dearly, but I wish she would have let me pick them out. I remember one time I was playing T-ball and you know, you use metal bats as a kid, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. She, and I said, mom, I need a bat for this, like my practice or whatever. She came home with a wooden bat and it was like an adult wooden bat. And I was like, all right, well, that's, you should have let me go with you. <laughs> but yeah. uh, as a kid, I'd say, let them pick it out, whatever they like. It doesn't much Great matter. Point. All that matters is that they have fun. Um, yeah. But when you start getting a little more uh, older or whatever, I am a Rawlings guy through and through. It's usually the debate is Rawlings or Wilson. Yep. Um, and, uh, and I am a Rawlings guy. 100%. Awesome. I think it's the best glove uh, on the market. So, well, thank you, Michael. Well, so I'm, I'm set. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, I'm really grateful, Michael. I guess just any last things that you'd like to say to to our men. I mean, I know that I I wanted to get those couple questions in, and you you just had such a great um, closer um, <laughs> prior to to those last couple questions. But but I'm I'm appreciative. So, any last things that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a country music fan too. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I know John, you're in uh, Dallas, so you better like yeah. country music. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I go back to, the I'm in Tulsa. Don't I get oh, you're in Tulsa. So, yeah, yeah. No, you guys are, we're not as big a fans of Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, so it's kind of a little <laughs> bit of friendly rivalry, but, uh, I'll still take Oklahoma over Pennsylvania. So I'll give you that. Um, <sighs> but, uh, I, I go back to, you know, a song that I've, I've, I've loved since I was in uh, high school, like early college called This One's For You by mm. Luke Combs. Um, and uh, uh, I just have so many people to thank. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, God, I'm, I'm so grateful to him and the Blessed Mother for their intercessions. But I've had so many uh, people who I believe the Holy Spirit has acted through uh, in this life. Um, you know, whether that be Jim Fry, Gus Bondi, um, Joe Spano, my parents, uh, Father Ross Chamberlain, who has who has stuck in the fight with me, um, 
you know, uh, for, for four or five years now. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you to them. Uh, and uh, we all need, you know, and Catholicism is so good at realizing that this is a community aspect, you know, yeah. like it, we need, we need each other. Um, and, uh, and I'm so grateful to those people. And there's so many people that I didn't get the chance to name. Um, but, um, but you know, if, if you're parishioners, I'm sorry, your parishioners, you guys aren't running a parish, but if you're mm-hmm. listeners, um, you know, think of it, please pray for me, um, for health and success and for, for, for guidance, uh, in terms of what God wants me to do with my life. Uh, and so I, I just recently too, have been hoping the Holy spirit, been talking more with and praying to the Holy spirit and asking, um, you know, him to, to intercede on my life and to, to help me act and to grant me grace. So, um, again, and just, and, and to reiterate, to hit it, if I haven't said it enough, um, talk to the blessed mother. Uh, she, uh, she'll pray for you. If, uh, if, uh, it's funny, I'll say I'm rambling a little bit, but, uh, in the Our Lady of Good Success Novena, it says at the very end, um, it says, Dine to answer my requests, uh, so long as it contributes to the salvation of my soul and the glory of Holy Mother Church, whatever. And, and I think those two things, um, uh, you know, that's what we should think about anytime we're making a decision in life. You know, is this good for my soul? Uh, and does it help the growth of the church? And uh, if it does those two things, I think, you know, the chances are that um, unless God has something better, and sometimes he does, um, but he'll grant it. And if he doesn't, it's because it doesn't do those two things. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to to figure out right now in my own prayer Man. life. So uh, again, thank you. Please pray for me. I'll pray for you guys as well. Awesome, Michael. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you joining us. And as we like to end every episode. Be a man, be a saint.